Again, thank you for coming out in Manual Worship Center and those who perhaps are at home right now watching us on the, on the uh, internet, uh, online, on Facebook. Uh, uh, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for being a blessing. Thank you who share every week. Uh, the, throughout the week, I see why you share it on your Facebook page so that others may partake. And you know, we're not the only ones out there. I mean, there are so many out there right now that's preaching the word. So many out there that that, that, that purpose is to lift up the name of Jesus Christ. It's not about a certain church or not about a certain person, a certain personality. It's about the person of Jesus Christ. Amen? All right. Listen, listen, if you did not get a chance to listen to the message that Pastor Kerry preached last Sunday, please go online to EWCE Online or go on Facebook and listen to this tremendous message. What a challenge he gave us, especially concerning the Word of God. It was a blessing. In fact, uh, also, uh, I, Pastor Bobby's message several weeks ago, uh, that song that I also, and uh, we got some excellent ministers and teachers in our body, and uh, we want to be using them throughout the year. I do want to make one other announcement. I want you to put it on your um, calendar. I really want you to be here that Sunday morning. Uh, my son and his wife will be here the last Sunday of February. The last Sunday of February. And I'm asking God just to use him in a, in a mighty way. I told him I wasn't so interested in him sharing what's all going on in, in the work that they're doing in Wales as I am in just allowing the Lord speak to him for our congregation. Amen? And to use him. I love to see the, the gifts and the manifestation of the, of the Spirit uh, in my son's life. All right. Let's turn, if you will, again to uh, Revelation, the 19th chapter. And we do have it up on the screen. Revelation, the 19th chapter. Yeah. Now, we step away from the pulpit last uh, uh, Sunday, and uh, I appreciate every one of you who watch online since we could not get here because of the weather. But uh, this is our continuation of our series on what takes place after the rapture. And we do believe in the rapture, amen? amen. Hey, if you don't believe in the rapture, that's called, you, you call an unbeliever. And if you call an unbeliever, that means that, well, you won't partake in it, all right? But if you're a child of God, you will. Whether you believe in the rapture or not, if you're a child of God, you're going to believe in it when it takes place, when it happens. Hello? Amen. Uh, but now we, and we have seen uh, that, that that involves the, the transformation of our bodies. We get a brand new body. Amen? A glorified body. That happens immediately. We know it happens in the twinkling of an eye, in one billionth of a second. You can go back and listen to some of the previous messages. And then we know that we're going to be escorted before the Father, and we're going to receive the praises of the Father. Uh, 1 Corinthians 4.1. The praises of the Father, we're going to hear him say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. And then we're going to go before the judgment seat of Christ. And we've spoken about that. And now we are speaking concerning that which takes place after the judgment seat of Christ. Now, how many of you believe you're real? Uh, yeah. Anybody here, you, you believe you're a real person? You, 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 you stand up and you get up in the morning, you look in the mirror and all say, oh, that, that's a real person. That's me right there, you know. Uh, 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 if you walk outside and you look around and say, well, you know what? This is the earth. Look, look at the earth. It's beautiful. It's fine. Let me tell you, heaven is more real. If we can get that eternal perspective, my friend. But many of us, even in the Christian circle, we, we do not get that, that, that perspective uh, of what eternity is. The scripture says that compared to eternity, our life is but a vapor. What does that mean? Well, light a match. Blow it out. That's how your life is compared to eternity. Now, I don't know how long your life is. My life has been, uh, you know, I'm, I'm aging each day, getting a little bit older, you know. Uh, I've been 39 now for almost twice. Not quite, but, you know. Uh, 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 here's, here's the thing, you know, uh, you know it's, I'm getting older, and, and it's real. But eternity is so much more real. And, it's, and, and, and while as my 
days here upon earth may be limited to a few years as far as this physical body is concerned. Eternity is, are you ready? Forever. Now, we can't comprehend forever. We, 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 we like to. And, and God has somewhat placed it in our hearts to have an understanding of it, according to Ecclesiastes, the third chapter. But the fact of it is, we can't grasp hold of the fact that life does not end. And the reason is because we see everything with a beginning and with an end. But the fact of it is, life does not end. Now, this, this physical body, because of sin, the Bible says in, in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. And because of sin, this physical body of ours has but a, a number limited of days and a number of years. But the fact of it is, life does not cease. We have an endless existence. We will continue after we draw our breath here upon this earth. And our destiny is determined by the faith that we have right now or the faith we do not have right now in Christ Jesus. I wish there was some... No, I don't wish. This is the best way, the greatest way. But Jesus said, I am the only way in John 14, 6. The apostle said in Acts 4, 12, neither is there any other way. No other name is given under heaven by why a man must. That word is imperative. It means it cannot happen any other way. It can be no other way but this way. Of all the 4,200 religions in the world, that's only one way. And that's through Jesus Christ. And we are going to celebrate God's very purpose for the church. And that's the wedding of the Lamb. Father desire in his heart before the foundation of the world. He kept it hidden in the scriptures as a, mighty, as a mystery, but it was revealed to us in the New Testament by Jesus and by the apostles. And that is, he desired to have a wife for his son. And church, you're the bride. And that marriage is going to take place soon. Soon it will happen. And so we find that after the judgment seat of Christ, after we have received our wedding garments according to our works of righteousness. No, we're not saved by works. You cannot earn your way into heaven. You heard me say several weeks ago that if you could feed every, every poor person or every, uh, every homeless person, if you could heal everyone, if, if, if you could miraculous, just it would not be good enough to get you into heaven. There was only one way, and that's through the sacrificial death of the Lamb. We're the bride, folks, and we're soon to be the wife. And so last week we read to you concerning Revelation, the 19th chapter, and we began at the 6th verse, and we got through the 9th ninth verse. And so we're just going to read the verses to you today. We did not, uh, we, last time we uh, did an expository on, just about on, on each of the verses, but we, we want to get through the message so we can get to part 2 this morning. And so John is saying here in the 19th chapter, verse 6, and I'm reading from the Amplified. Remember the Amplified version of the Bible, simply amplify the meaning uh, of the original word in its original language. And then I heard something like the shout of a vast multitude, and like the boom of many pounding waves, and like the roar of mighty peals of thunder saying, Hallelujah! Uh, here I go already. Got to stop you. I didn't share this last time. Hallelujah! Amen? But we, now, we did shout hallelujah, and we did practice hallelujah, and I hope that, you know, during this week we had practiced that word hallelujah. That the word here in the, the Greek and, 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 and in many places translated as hallelujah, but it's, it's a transfer of, uh, from, the, from the Hebrew word hallelujah. And that, that word hala, you know what that word hala means? At the marriage of the Lamb, we're going to have one hala of a time. Because hala means to be glamorously foolish, it means to shine. It means to boy, be boyous. It means to be loud. In fact, it means to party it up. It means to be festival. And the word, hallelujah, that, that means the Lord. Hala, hala, praise, one of the 19th words translated in the scripture as praise. And that word, hala, means a, to have a festival attitude, to, to celebrate, to be boisterous about it, to be loud about it. And on that day, when we see the bridegroom, the bride is going to say, hallelujah! Amen. And we're going to act foolish. Amen. We're going to act beside ourselves. You haven't seen anything now. 
You, you think sometimes we get enough food. I tell you what, you, sometimes I, I, I'm going to tell on myself. And I hope I don't rob myself of a lesson. But you know, there's been times that I've got so excited in this church that I've ran from one pit, pulpit over the other, over to this pulpit and back. And I don't mean once, I mean it's, it's good exercise. Amen. Just, I, I just wanted to express. I just felt, I felt good. Excited. Because of who we are in Christ Jesus. Yeah. So it says, Hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty, the Omnipotent, the rule of all reigns. Let us rejoice and shout for joy. Give Him glory and honor. The marriage of the Lamb has come at last. And His bride, that's His redeemed. I did this. His redeemed has prepared herself. She has been permitted, now we covered all this last, last time, to dress in fine linen, dazzling white and clean. For the fine linen signifies the righteous acts of the saints. They are the deeds, my friend, that are done in this life by you and I as believers, which will make up our wedding garment that we will wear when we attend that marriage. But it's not all of us, as I mentioned, will have on the same wedding garment, the same wedding dress. You, you brides, we got several different brides in here this morning that are now wives, but I'm sure that, that every one of you dress alike at your wedding. You dress different. You had on a different wedding dress. They might look very much similar and the same, but they still were different at the time. And it was according to your personality, according to what you desire and what you want. Well, let me tell you something. See, we're, we're picking out our wedding dress now. We're picking, that, picking out our wedding garments for eternity now. And we're doing it by our faithfulness in what God has called us to do. We're doing it, see, when we stand at the adjustment seat of Christ, uh, all that which is earthly, all that which is of wood, hay, and straw, uh, all those things that we gave so much attention to, and, and we need to give attention to it, but I'm talking about even raising, uh, uh, well, you know, you will be rewarded for raising your family. That, that is, I believe, a crown for uh, for a, a parent, for how they brought that child up in the nurturing of the, the Lord. I, 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 I believe that's scripture. But, be, but we're going to, you know, a lot of the things that we have, our careers and, you know, the things that we, I mean, they're important to us in this life. We're not to neglect those things and take them for granted and everything. But the spiritual things far outweighs those matters. Amen? And, and the things that we do have ought to be used for the kingdom of God. The very neighborhood you live in. Yeah, according to Acts, the 17th chapter, you're just not in that neighborhood because you chose it. That, that's a purpose of your read, that, that God wants you in the particular neighborhood that, you, that you're in so that you can be a shining light to those around you and that you can share the gospel and that you can minister to them in, in their particular needs and all. I, I've seen my wife do this. I've seen her go across the street and, uh, 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 in our neighborhood and sit on a, uh, on a porch and, and, and minister a couple and weep with them and, and cry with them and, and pray with them. She wasn't there by accident. I see the same thing about our, 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 our next door neighbors and those down the, the, the street. And I'm sure that many of you have been asked and called upon by the Lord to do the very same thing. But a lot of these things, see, are just going to burn up. You know, that career that we gave so much time to that we thought was so important in our life. And so we gave more time to that than we did the spiritual matters and everything and all. Uh, when we get over that, we're going to find that's all we had was that career. It's gone now. It was temporary. Hello? Yet if we use that career for the first and other gospel of Jesus Christ, we take our businesses, whatever, everything, and we, we make God's purpose first, and everything, you know what? God's not only going to reward, he said he'll not only award, listen, this is scripture, he said he'll not only award your business here on earth, but he awarded it in heaven. Hello? I don't know where I'm going with this, but this is good. But the fact of it is, we are not saved by our own good works, we're saved because of the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. His great love that he has for his bride. His sacrifice that will now permit us to become his wife for all eternity. And I want you to know, the Father has, will have it no other way. He has signed the Holy Spirit to deal with everyone. That whosoever will may come and be part of that, that bride. So we find that it says that the church is at last become his wife. Now, we, I mentioned last time, if you notice in verses 7 and 8, that they're past tense. You say, how can it be past tense? You, you know, it's a future event. It hasn't taken place yet. So how can it be written in past tense? Because it's going to be, it's going to be 
Hello. It's just as real right now in eternity as if it has already happened. Did you get that? You could bank on that. You could Listen, that's a sure thing. It's a sure thing. Let, let, let me put it this way. God's not going to change his mind about the wife that he's chosen for Christ. The Father's not going to change his mind about the bride that he's chosen. It's going to be a sure thing. It's going to take place, my friend. And according to Malachi 2.14, it is marriage is a, a covenant relationship before God and with God. See, it's just not, as, as I mentioned, a legal contract. It's a covenant relationship that we have right now with the Father. So it's more than just a, a, a marriage contract. It's more than just a legal contract. It's compared to that which we have in relationship with the Father. It's a covenant involving three. God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, but also the Godhead, man, and woman. See, contracts and covenants are not the same. While a contract is legally binding, a covenant is a spiritual agreement. A contract is agreement between parties, while a covenant is a pledge made between parties. A contract says, do this for me, and I'll do that for you. But a covenant says, I pledge my life to you, no matter. That's why we say in sickness and in health. That's why we say in the good times and the bad times. We say for better or for worse. It's a covenant between God. You, we need to be very careful how we honor that covenant. Amen? So in the fulfillment of the marital covenant, two becomes one. Hello? It's a new unity. It's a, it's a diversity, a new diversity. A new family is established. Where, even though we remain as distinct people, even though we do not become even as our bridegroom is a God, however, we're going to be one with him in all of unity for all unity and all of eternity. So from the Bible's point of view, the two now shall the mystery of becoming one. That's why Paul wrote, so husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Boy, I must really love myself. I, never, I, I didn't realize how much I love myself. Because it said to love thy wives as thy own bodies, and he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hates his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. You know you cherish your body. Come on, you do. You do. Uh, yeah, you know, exercise. Now, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about that psh, that you get out there. I had a man come to me one time. I saw him. He was getting on his wife for gaining weight. I mean, he was after her on everything. And I look at him. I said, when you do? He said, what? I said, when are you do? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, you're lucky. You're, like, you're nine months pregnant. You're ready to, to give a child, come up for a child any time, and you're getting on her about her weight? Hello, men. Any ladies want to say amen? Yeah. All right. I got one spot. One, 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 what, just one. Because he said, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, listen to what he says. This is a great mystery, but I speak what concerning Christ and the church. So as Christ prepares to come this second time to set up his visible earthly kingdom, guess what? He doesn't come back by himself. Amen. When I went off to college, I came back, and so did my brother. In fact, we call our college Southern Bridal College. It was Southern Bible College, but a lot of the young men that run off to college, they run home with life came back with life. I want you to know when Jesus leaves heaven uh, the second time, the first time he came alone, amen, as a small babe, this time he's coming back as the king of kings and the lord of lords, and he's coming with a wife. Yeah. He's coming with you and I yeah. because we're the wife. And for all eternity, we're going to enjoy the oneness of our Savior. So what I want us to look at this morning briefly, and I say it's going to be briefly, that this marriage takes place in heaven. Now, you say, why is that important? Well, first of all, it's important because that's what the Lord planned. Let me tell you something. If we, church, could just get a revelation 
and see the purpose of the Father in having a, a wife for his son. And see, that has been the plan before the foundations of the world, according to what is it? Uh, well, several scriptures, but it, it, Paul speaks about it in Ephesians, the first chapter, when he talks about before the foundation of the world. Before the foundation of the world, this plan was committed. Before the, fa- before the creation, God has a plan. And that plan very much involves his son. But it very much involves you and I. The church is predestinated. The church is God's plan of the ages. It will be fulfilled, and that marriage will take place. But, but if we could get an, a, a, a revelation of, of the very purpose of it, that, that God so loved his son, not that just he gave his only begotten son, that he just so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, but that he just so loved the world that he has prepared for his, I mean, for his son, he just so loved his son that he's prepared for his son a bride. And if we could get a, a, a hold of that, we could get, get the realization of that, we could get the rhema of that, it would, it would have, have a great effect upon how we live our lives today. We're being prepared. We're being made ready, the Scripture says, as we will get into. So we're going to find that the marriage takes place in heaven, and then something follows that. What follows that? Will be Well, an invitation is given let me read the ninth verse. Then the angel said to me, Right blessed are those who invited to the... Now listen, to the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is not your invitation. You're not invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. You're invited to the marriage of the Lamb, so you're automatically including what? The marriage supper of the Lamb. But there are going to be special guests that will see that God has invited. He said, then the angel said to me, Right blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me further, These are the true and exact words of God. You want to argue with someone about it? Argue with him. He said, These are the true and exact words of God. So the order of the future events for the church will be the rapture which we receive our new glorified bodies, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 52, and 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. We're going to be escorted into heaven by Christ and the angels before the Father, 1 Corinthians 4, 1, and receive the praise of the Father. Then our works will be rewarded the beam of judgment seat of Christ. We'll receive our wedding garments, Revelation 19 and 8, Revelation, I mean, 1 Corinthians 3 and 4, and 2 Corinthians 5 and 10, and many other scriptures. And all of this, my friend, I want you to realize, is taking place in heaven. People, heaven is real. Heaven is real. Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the what? The heavens and the earth. We can look around, we, we see the earth. Uh, but we can't see over into the spiritual world. We, 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 the, the Scripture tries to describe it in various places and, and gives a description for it. And, and John tries very hard throughout the book of Revelations, that, but we still can't grasp hold of it. Pa- Paul said it was so magnificent and everything that in his experience that, that, that he couldn't describe it. There was no earthly words. There no, no, no way to articulate what he saw in heaven, in paradise. And so there, heaven is, is real. And we're going to spend time there. Now, we know we're going to spend at least seven years there. Some are spending more time there now. My, my mom and dad have been there for a while, and I know Peter and Paul, and they, they've been there for, for a while. But the wonderful thing about heaven is that it's, not, it's our permanent home, but it's not our permanent dwelling. Do you understand that? You see, see, one day the visible world and the invisible world are going to be one. And you and I, with the spiritual body that we're going to have, even though it's a physical, spiritual body, we are going to be able just to, just to go from heaven to from earth to heaven, from heaven to earth. It's going to be interchangeable for us. It, we, we, uh, we explained it, Pastor Ken. I just did. Best way I can do it. I'm sorry. All right. But this takes place in heaven. And, 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 and let's look at. Well, I got time maybe for just a couple of scriptures before I close. I. I'm sorry, folks. I, I need to say more with my, my preaching than my, my uh, 
stories, I guess. But Revelation 11, look at verse 15. I want to show you, I want to prove it to you. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet. Now we've covered the trumpet's judgments. And I'm, have you, please take note of how busy the angels are in heaven and in earth during this time period. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven. Hmm. <laughs> Every while I read, it's about, I'm, it's about being loud. Hello? Now, let me back up a little bit. Let's read it again. The seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices. Wow. Say it again. In heaven, all right? Saying... We're going to be proclaiming the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign for how long? Forever and forever. Listen, friend. I, I don't care about the lies of the fools. The scripture says that, you know, this is all there is in this life. That there is no life after death. All those who say there's no heaven, no hell. Uh, that's just unbelief. I choose to believe God. Amen? I don't always understand all Scripture. I wish I did, but, but I, I understand more of it today than I did 40 years ago. Somewhat. And I learn from those who have, have that God has used to, to open the Scripture up. I, I'm so thankful for those. But listen. Now listen to what it says. Verse 16. And the 24 elders... Now, we've gone over the fact we helped you to recognize that the 24 elders are the church. They're the church. Now, listen. And where are they sitting? What are they sitting on? They're sitting on that. And whose thrones is it? No. Nope. Read it. It's their thrones. They're sitting on that thrones. But yeah, you're right. It, 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 all of them are gods. But they're, listen, it said that they're sitting on who? their thrones. Sitting on their thrones. Thrones. Why? Before God. Why is God? In heaven. So for the past several minutes of Scripture, we've been talking about a place called what? Heaven. So all this is in heaven. All this is taking place in heaven, correct? All this is happening in heaven. We, where, where are we? We, we? We're in heaven. We've got a picture of heaven right here. So notice this now. Notice. It says... Fell on that, they, before God, fell on their faces, and they did worship God, saying, we'll give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is, who was, for you have taken your great power, and you have begun to reign. Now, people, listen. Listen. Now, where are we? All right. So it said, the nations rage. This is a fulfillment of Psalms, the second chapter, by the way. You need to study Psalms 2 in relationship to this verse. The nation rage, but your wrath came. What's the wrath of God? The great tribulation. It's God's wrath. Remember the, the great tribulation? People will experience the wrath of God. They will, that's the Father. They will experience the wrath of the Lamb. Revelation 6 chapter. They will experience the wrath of Lucifer, of Satan. I mean, I, I don't want to be here. I don't know why people insist on going through the great tribulation. Well, well, King, the church has to suffer. Tell me when the church has not suffered. I, when I read over in the book of Acts, and I read in the Bible, and I read the history of the church, I hear people being thrown to the lions. I hear people being, having their heads cut off. I, I have people being burned at the stake. I, I read where people are, are having thorns thrust through them, where they've been hung upside down, where they've been thrown over cliffs, where they've been mauled by lions. There's always been persecution and tribulation in the church, but not always in the same place. I mean, even in the early church, there was places that they would run to to get away from persecution from where they were. Did you hear me? You read the Scriptures, you read Acts, you'll see where the Christians fled, fled persecution. They fled certain places where persecution was very severe. And we've been blessed in the United States. That's persecution and tribulation going on in the world right now. It has for centuries. It has, has been since the church began. Jesus said in John 16, 33, in this world you'll have tribulation. There has always been persecution of the Christians. Always tribulation. We've been blessed in the United States. That we've been one of those places like in the, the 
why in the early church that many of them would have ran to to escape the severe persecution that they were under. And so we've been blessed. Oh, we, we I mean, we, we, we're tolerant now, and I'm not saying we are tolerant. We are being tolerated. Hey, hello? Hey, hey, look, I just got back on, on Facebook, amen? Uh, I've already been censored for community standards. I hadn't said anything yet. But I will tell you this, I will speak what the Bible says. I'll speak what the Scripture says. If the Bible says that marriage between a man and a woman, marriage between a man and a woman. If the Bible says that our DNA is according to our, I mean, our, gen, our gen, uh, identity is according to our DNA, that's what the Scripture says. It's not me saying it, I'm just telling what the Word of God says. Okay? But here's the thing. Let's read it, listen. The wrath, we know that's talking about the tribulation. All right? We know what the great tribulation is. Time of the tribulation. See, see, let, let me say this too. The great tribulation is going to be worldwide. There will not be a spot on the earth that a Christian can run to to hide. It will be a worldwide persecution, a worldwide tribulation. The whole earth will be affected by this. And folks, it's coming. It's, it's, it's going to happen soon. Many of you might have not just heard of, of, of the, the volcano eruption this, this past week in one of the, uh, uh, in the South Seas uh, uh, that, that was so, so explosive. It says it, was the, it had the magnitude of 10, how you say it, Janet? Hiroshima, Hiroshima atomic bombs. 10! That's how powerful that one. Can you imagine when earthquakes starts happening all over this earth? Man, I'm tell you what, I'm going to be enjoying the marriage of the Lamb. Listen. So let me read. The nations raged, but your wrath came. Your wrath came, talking about the tribulation, and the time for the dead. Now this is speaking about the first resurrection. The time for listen for the dead to be what judge. Now what are we talking about? Now why was that? We're talking about the judgment seat of Christ. That's why the judgment takes place. How do you know it's, it's, it's talking about the judgment seat of Christ? Because of what it says next. And for rewarding, and for rewarding, uh, I, I'm stuck. For rewarding, hello? This is the time for the dead, those that are talking about the, those resurrected saints, talking about you and I, that we're going to be judged. And, reward, and it says, for the rewarding of your servants, for your prophets, for your saints. Uh-oh. That's... We, if you've got a black pen, you, according to some people, you need to go ahead and wipe out prophets there. I mean, even though Scripture says that that's what they go. But according to many theologians today, the office of the prophet don't operate anymore. Hello? Yeah, that's right. They're bad. I tell you what. Yeah, I, I listened to Michael Cotton and Clem Ferrer and several others this past weekend on a, a prophetic conference that they held over in Greensboro, even though the snow and sleet and everything. And you can go online, go to Bethany Fellowship Church, Bethany Fellowship Church, and look up the prophetic conference, and you need to hear some of these men speaking. Listen, they're not teaching you how to prophesy. They're teaching you what it's all about. Amen? Uh, you will enjoy it. I, I, I challenge you to do so. Uh, uh, but it says that the prophets, hello, and the saints... Oh, prophets and saints are together. Now, who are they? And where are they? They're the church, and they're in heaven. And also those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers. That's the unholy trinity of the earth. How do you know it's in heaven? Because then it's saying God's temple in heaven was open, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. And there were flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder and earthquake and heavy hail. Why is all of this taking place, folks? It's taking place in heaven. While the nations are raging upon the earth, God and his people, we're having a good time. In fact, we're having a halo of a good time celebrating that we're soon to become the wife of the Lamb of God. Let, let me give you a couple of others to show you what I'm talking about. Matthew 5, 12. Luke 6, 23. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is in heaven. So all of this is taking place in heaven. And so the marriage of the Lamb will take place in heaven. 
But now listen to this. We also read in 2 John 1, 8, watch yourselves so that you may not lose what you've worked for, but you may have a full reward. Some say, Pastor Ken, uh, 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 not Pastor Ken, let's say that someone asks you, say, well, can you help with the kids and children ministry? Or they say, we need help with this or we need help with that. You say, well, you, you know, I really don't have it. Let somebody else do it. You might just have this word, given an eternal award away. Now listen, I know we cannot be involved in everything. And thank God this is not Emmanuel Worship Center. It's not. But Pastor Curry said something last week. He said some Christians, they get saved and they never do anything. You know there are four members. I thank God they don't belong to this church. Four members. Almost every church has them. But thank God we don't. And that's the member that's called somebody, the member called anybody, the, the member that's called everybody, and then that's one called nobody. Everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody. Pastor needed something done, so he asked everybody. Everybody said, well, anybody can do it. And anybody said, well, somebody ought to do it. And you know who did it? Nobody. Thank God we don't have that membership here. I thank God for you people. Yesterday when the word went out that we needed uh, uh, some help here at the church, uh, we had to call some people and tell them not to come. Thank you for coming. But at the Bema, before the wedding, we're going to receive these wedding garments. Again, as I mentioned, salvation is not at stake here. Hello? Salvation is not... Let's say, you, you, you're, if you're at the judgment seat of Christ, if you're at the wedding of the Lamb, you are saved. But let me tell you what does matter. Priority. What you're doing now. Our salvation is secured by faith in the finished work of Christ. But our rewards are according to how we live our Christian life. So how have you been living? How have you been living, my friend? Are you going for the goal? I mean, we have plenty of wood, hay, and straw, and things of this world to do and take care of. And we, nothing wrong, again, with doing it. Nothing wrong with having a career. You should have a career. Hello? You, you should. Uh, and families are important. You should be seeking to raise a family. Marriage and all these things, are, are, they are important. And we should not neglect it. But at the same time, these are the things that we have here in this life as we prepare for the life that is to come. Amen? Let me see why I can stop, folks. Let me find a place. Mm. Yeah. Um, uh, oh, well. Maybe the best thing I should do is stop, huh? Uh, 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 let me mention then, again, I say priority is, is matters greatly. At works matter greatly and only God knows how many days or months we have left before he comes but we should also as I mentioned we should be involved in the things of this life such as career and education and marriage and family and friends and leisure and vacations and so forth God wants you to enjoy those things and so do not feel condemned hello when you do I, I, I know of Christians that that they go on vacation and and, and they they've they, they, the whole time they're there, they can't enjoy the vacation because of condemnation. Well, you know, I, 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 I should be back at the church doing this. I'm talking about some preacher's friends of mine now. I used to be one of them. Hello? God, no, God wants you to enjoy those times. He just wants you to keep Colossians 3, 1 and 3, and Matthew 6 and 33. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things and set your affection on things that are above. Why Christ said it's at the right hand of the Father, not on things of the earth. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and these other things will be added to you. God wants you to enjoy these other things. However, when we begin to anticipate the marriage of the Lamb, it'll make a difference in how we live. It'll make a difference for all eternity. It'll make a difference on how we run this race. It'll make a, a difference concerning the priorities in our life. We need to yield our life right now to him. We need to determine that by his grace and his power, we're going to obey his word and be faithful where God has set us. We're not going to be, the, it's going to be the motivation of love.
not as a hireling who, who's working for a reward, who's working for a wage, but it was going to be something that we do out of love for the husband, love for the bridegroom, love to please them. It's funny how things change in the courtship. We live to please our spouses, our, our, our soon-to-be spouses. Yeah. Then we get married. Shouldn't be. Hello. And it's not. I believe that for all of you. I wish I could complete the message this morning. But what is important to realize that all this is going to take place in heaven before we return with Jesus Christ to the earth. And then when we return with Christ to the earth, listen. We come with the, our husband. He destroys the Antichrist and the false beast. They're cast into the lake of fire. Satan is bound, placed into a pit for a thousand years. Then we'll judge the nations and we'll judge angels. Hello. We'll have the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, the reason I said all of that is so you have an understanding. All of that happened the first 75 days of the millennium. Did you hear me? The first 75 days of the millennium. You know, they, they talk about the president, his first 100 days, and all that he's going to get accomplished. But in the first 75 days, Jesus will completely destroy the armies of the earth. Hello? Oh, oh I, I left out the fact that the Old Testament and the, uh, and, the, uh, and the tribulation saints are going to be raised. Hello? That's going to be the judgment of the nation, the separation of the sheep nation and the ghost nations. Hello? Satan, that, again, like I said, his fourth judgment, bound in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. Antichrist and the false prophet thrown into the lake of fire. We're going to judge the angels. I mean, all, it's going to be a very busy 75 days. And yet, during that 75 days, we're going to have the marriage supper of the Lamb. In 75 days, God completely, through Christ His Son, changed the whole scope of the nations of the world, rearranged all the nations of the world, rearranged even the earth itself, I don't know how it's going to, I know it's going to be beautiful. But he's going to, listen, you know, two-thirds of the earth is going to be destroyed with, with fire and famine and everything. But the Lord, he's going to sweep in and he said, you talking about climate change? Uh, you talking about architectural work like you've never seen before? I mean, that's going to be new mountains, new streams, new seas. Hallelujah! And you and I are part of it! I pray you are. Are you preparing for it? What part will you have? Are you getting ready? Your part is determined by the Father. The two disciples came to Jesus. Let us set one on your right and one on your left. Jesus said, you don't know what you ask. That's in the Father's hand. You know, he's doing the commission. I'm doing the arrangement. But don't worry, you're going to be taken care of. You're going to be taken care of. But let's prepare now. Not let's wait to the last minute. Hello? Let's begin with prayer now. Let's begin with doing the things that God has called upon us to do. One of the things that God's called upon you to do is pray for the lost. Pray for harvesters. Jesus said, the fields are white. Pray for harvesters. Pray for those who are able to go out. Pray for those who are, that, that, that can come. You, know, you, you see people every day that I, I, I don't know. I, I just got back on, on Facebook and... Uh, so a couple of people sent me that, that friends request, and then they told me to go down that friends list and choose out the ones that, that, that uh, were, used to be my friends. And I went down a couple of lists, and I didn't recognize those, a lot of those names. They're thy friends. People they knew. And that's people that you know that I will never reach. That's why it's so important that we, we, we share the good things of the gospel over on Facebook. Now, that's why it's important that we, we go and, 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 and share uh, some of the messages that our pastors preach and some of the things that we have going on at our church because they, they, I can show it on my Facebook and they'll never hear it. They'll never see it. But it's an opportunity for you to use it for good, not for the bad that some people use it. Amen. I've gone long enough. I was too excited about seeing y'all folks this morning, so let me shut up. Father. Lord, what an exciting time we're going to have. 
What a glorious time we're going to have. Father, at that wedding of the Lamb. But right now, Father, the Holy Spirit is at work in our lives. He's busy in our lives, and he's using the fivefold ministry, and he's using the various other gifts of the Father and the gifts of the, the Spirit, but he, 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 to, to tune us up, to get us ready, and, and to, to be anxious and to be prepared to do our best and to be our best for our bridegroom. Father, help us. I need help, Lord. I need help. I, I ask you every day when I get up to pray to tell me how to pray, to teach me what to pray. And Father, I'm so glad that you at times very prospectively give me, very specifically give me things to pray about because they're the things that's on your heart, Holy Spirit. And so Father, may we begin to pray that way. Say, Holy Spirit, direct who shall we pray today? What person do you bring to my mind today? Who do you want me to contact today? <laughs> Father, I'm a yielded vessel to you. Well, I'm going to take this time. I've set aside this time for you. Father, I can set a time for work. I can set a time for play. I can set a time for leisure. I can set a time for TV. I can set a time for this and that. Lord, I will now set a time, a special time for you to speak to me, to instruct me how to pray, how to live. I surrender my life to you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. I hope you prayed that prayer with me today. Amen. Pastor Curry mentioned last week, just start off. Yes. Amen. Remember, over on the other church, other building, we, we, one time I had a prayer tree, and we put the names of people on there with ribbons and tied them. And then when God answered those prayers, that person was saved. We took the ribbon off and sent it to them. I remember the first ribbon that came off of that tree was sent to a supermodel who had been on the cover of Sports Illustrated. One of our members' niece. Her, her niece came to know Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. I've got loved ones that might seem almost impossible. But Luke 1 37, Mark 9 23, and a dozen other scriptures says, With God, nothing is impossible. Amen. So, Father, Right now, we present our loved ones. We, we, we present the one, Father, not, not, not just the one that's so down and out, but that one's Father so uppity. That one who, who's so educated and so well off that they have need nothing and they know everything. And so they don't need you, Lord. They say, my barrels are full and my bonds are full and I, I, I'm just going to eat, drink, be merry and enjoy my life here. And yet, Father, that man sitting in the rich mountain has just as much a need of you as that one sitting in the gutter. And Father, you say it's even harder for him to enter into the gates, to enter into the kingdom of God than it is for that one. But Lord, you say it's not impossible. It's not impossible. So Father, we ask that you reach the unreachable. No matter that status in life, that you reach the unreachable. And that God, may we just show them love. Lord, when they ridicule us, make fun of us. Lord, may we not get in an argument with us because they like to argue. May we just simply state our faith, live our life, and God, there be the ones that will come to us when that need arise. We ask this in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hey, thank you for coming out today. Did you enjoy?